this lecture will continue our discussion on liquid scintillation counting. If you could recall in previous lecture, we were discussing about the diff various aspects of liquid scintillation counting. Like we were discussing about how energy transfer takes place from a radioisotope to the solid uh, to, to solvent from solvent to primary floor and secondary floor and then finally, electrical signal generating through the photomultiplier tube. We have seen through the different advantages and disadvantages of liquid scintillation counting. Uh, if you could recall where we have seen that how the liquid scintillation counting method is very accurate, efficient and it is a versatile technique particularly for weak beta emitters. It has advantage of counting more than one isotope at a time if they have sufficient the different energy spectrum. So, you had lot of advantages of liquid scintillation counted, counting, but there were disadvantages also like quenching was a major problem or photomultiplier noise was a problem which has been solved to a certain extent. So, if you even if there are certain disadvantages like cost also, but they could be overlooked because of lot of advantages of liquid scintillation counting. Now, today we are going to discuss about uh, the sample preparation in liquid scintillation counting. So, we will uh, in sample preparation you require lot of things like sample vials, uh, what kind of uh, like scintillation cocktail has to be taken. Uh, what is the volume of the scint uh, scintillation cocktail, how sample needs to be prepared for proper counting, all these things we are going to discuss uh, in this lecture. Now, let us start with sample vials actually. As far as solid scintillation counting is concerned, sample preparation is easy and only involves transferring the sample to a glass or plastic vial compatible with the counter. But as far as liquid scintillation counting is concerned, sample preparation is complex and it starts with selection of suitable vial to be used. Now, types of vials which can be used which as a sample vials, they could be glass, they could be low potassium glass with low levels of 40 K and they could be plastic or polyethylene vials. Now, glass vials provide unparalleled optical clarity good visibility and they are chemically inert. So, making it suitable for use with aggressive reagents and where many solvents are used actually. Now, glass vials can be uh, reused many times if thoroughly cleaned and low potassium glass vials could be used where you can reduce the background count. So, uh, you have lot of advantages of glass vial uh, in here. Now, apart from glass vials, you can use plastic vials also. Now, plastic vials exhibits lower background label than glass. It is combustible and therefore, easier for waste disposal. It is shatter proof and therefore, sa safer in the laboratory. Uh, it, it is cheaper, but problem with this is you cannot reuse it. So, polyethylene vials give better transfer that is better light transfer and results in slightly higher counting efficiencies, but are inclined to exhibit more phosphorescence than do the glass vials. Uh, so, uh, you can choose which vial has to be used, it could be plastic vial or it could be glass vial. Now, what size of the vials needs to be used here? Now, most of the time uh, it could range from the size of the vials available could range from somewhere less than 4 ml up to 20 ml. Uh, in many photomultiplier tubes, it is uh, kind of 20 ml is the maximum uh, amount which is fixed due to the dimensions of uh, certain photomultiplier tubes. Now, mini vials may be used to reduce the cost and in terms of environmental issues where uh, scintillation fluids are toxic. So, you can use a uh, smaller amount of uh, sample and the scintillation cocktail. Now, some counters are designed to accept very small samples in special polyethylene bags split into array of many compartments. Uh, for example, in pharmaceutical industries for doing lot of different kinds of assays, you can use these kinds of uh, sample carriers or vials actually. Uh, then 
very important part of sample preparation is scintillation cocktails. Now, scintillation cocktails are mostly solution of floors and uh, there could be different types of scintillation cocktails and this will involve uh, solvent as well as primary and secondary floors. Now, two types of solutions uh, which are one is which is miscible with aqueous solution and one which are not miscible with aqueous solution. Now, the majority of radioactive species are present in an aqueous form and as such are not miscible with aromatic solvents which are your uh, uh, scintillators. Now, the most commonly used water accepting cocktail is dioxane and the most common water immiscible ones are toluene based cocktails. Now, uh, problem with this it will not take much of the aqueous samples as toluene and water are immiscible and massive quenching might result. A second solvent mixed with toluene can somewhat solve this problem, uh, but not to a great extent. Now, cocktails based on dioxin that is 1, 4 dioxin and naphthalene can accommodate up to 20 percent volume to volume water and can be used, but are they have been phased out due to toxicity. For most purposes less frequently used xylene based cocktails are suitable as uh, they have greater efficiency of detection than toluene and with lower toxicity. Uh, but toluene is more common because of low cost. So, the problem of this uh, where it cannot take a uh, lot of water this could be solved by uh, presence of surfactants in the cocktail which enables an aqueous sample to come into the intimate contact with the aromatic solvent by forming a stable micro emulsion. So, this could be one method to accept the aqueous solutions. So, therefore, emulsified cocktails are most frequently used for counting aqueous samples and they are composed of solvent, scintillators and surfactants which could be like for example, Triton X 100 could be used as a detergent here. Now, these can accept up to 50 percent water, uh, but many times problem occurs uh, which is of phase transition and they might uh, as water content increases uh, they might result into two phases appearing and this could uh, hamper uh, the accurate counting actually. So, a lot of ready made cocktails are available in market with very uh, precise instructions that could be used for uh, preparing your samples with particular scintillation cocktails. Uh, volume of cocktail is a very critical uh, in measurements or counting efficiencies. Uh, one has to use the same amount of volume uh, every time like for the sample and instruments need to be calibrated with the same value as for the experimental samples. So, this is very important for efficient scintillation counting uh, and which will vary with the sample volume. So, volume of the cocktail has to be uh, like same for both uh, standards as well as uh, like instruments needs to be calibrated with the same volume as you are going to use in experimental samples. Now, another problem which comes when you are preparing a sample how to overcome quenching problem. Now, the quenching problem could be solved by different methods are there and they have certain advantages and disadvantages and the user has to decide and come to a particular uh, uh, way to solve this problem. Now, samples can be bleached before counting if there is a color quenching. Now, bleaching agents there are a whole lot of bleaching agents like hydrogen peroxide uh, can be used, but this gives chemiluminescence. So, care has to be taken while using this hydrogen peroxide. There are solubilization systems like for example, there are alkaline systems, there are acidic systems. In alkaline system it is the alkaline hydrolysis and quaternary ammonium hydroxide or NaOH could be used. In acidic system it is the acidic oxidation and you can use perchloric acid, nitric acid or their mixtures could be utilized uh, for solubilization. There could be a lot of other systems also for solubilization. Uh, there are tissue solubilizers like solid samples such as plant and animal tissues are best counted after solubilization by quaternary amines such as NCS solubilizer or solvine. 
Now, solvin 350 is widely used. It is an organic based solubilizer formulated in toluvin. It is a classical industry standard solubilizer and it is used for biological and plant samples. It is a corrosive and flammable. So, uh, these all these solutions are highly toxic. So, the great care has to be taken while using them. Uh, how do you solubilize? It is a simple like you add sample to the glass vial, you add sample uh, a small amount of solubilizer and allow digestion to proceed and after digestion is complete, scintillation cocktail is added and the sample is counted. Uh, problems like chemiluminescence and others has to be needs to be uh, taken care of. They will be because of these uh, materials they might result or show some chemiluminescence. Now, there are combustion methods uh, which are a suitable alternative to bleaching or solubilization or digestion of tissues. Now, these combustion methods uh, in uh, how they are used is that samples are combusted in an atmosphere of oxygen in a combustion apparatus. Now, samples containing say 14 C would be combusted to 14 CO2 or carbon dioxide, now which could be collected in a trapped agent, trapping agent such as NOH and then counted. Samples containing say 3 H could be converted to 3 H 2 O for counting. So, likewise you can use lot of different methods where combustion could be an alternative. Uh, there could be lot of other methods for preparing sample for LSC, which could be like cutting of paper chromatogram, it could be membrane filters, uh, could be used gels which contain radioisotope. Uh, TLC scrappings etcetera could be uh, used uh, for uh, as a sample actually. Uh, now, all this sample preparation like I said uh, it involves uh, it is a com complex procedure and involves lot of different uh, 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 like materials. Now, there is a technique where you do not really have to go through the sample preparation and this is called serenocope counting. Now, serenocope counting uh, is one of uh, like upcoming, uh, it is going to be used and being used in combination quite a lot. Now, serenocope radiation is electromagnetic radiation emitted when a charged particle passes through a dielectric medium at a speed greater than the phase velocity of light in that medium. Now, it is useful for assaying uh, medium high energy emitters uh, in aqueous solution without using cocktail. So, that is the very important part that you really do not have to use a cocktail and floors and all those things. Uh, if has a decay energy like if certain radio isotopes or beta particle has a decay energy which is in excess of uh, 0.5 million electron volt, then this will cause water to emit bluish white light and which is referred to as serenicove light after its discover. This light can be detected using typical liquid scintillation counter. So, what you see is here that you really do not have to uh, do any sample preparation in terms of using scintillation cocktails, but it could be directly used for uh, measurement. Now, what are the advantages of this technique? One is that it is a very simple sample preparation, no requirement for organic solvents and floors. So, it is a relatively cheap uh, technique no problem of chemical quenching, uh, it can handle large volumes of aqueous solution for counting and it allows for analyzing beta emitting isotopes or liquid scintillation counting without using any cocktail. So, most work on this serenocope counting has been done on 32 p, which has 80 percent of its energy spectrum above the serenocope threshold and it can be uh, can be detected around uh, 40 percent efficiency. So, as the proportion of energy spectrum above 0.5 million electron volt increases, the detection efficiency will also increase. So, if you could look at uh, this table here, if you see here there are radioisotopes which has uh, uh, energy spectrum above 0.5 million electron volt, like you have percent of a spectrum which is uh, 60 above uh, 0.5 million electron volt is 60 percent for Na. Uh, 80 percent for 32 p, uh, then 30 percent for 35 c l and 90 percent for 42 k. And they have counting efficiencies which is 30, 40, 10 
and 80 percent respectively. So, what you see is here these isotopes could be used uh, for scintillation uh, liquid scintillation counting or serenocope counting in liquid scintillation counters. Now, this completes our section on the uh, liquid scintillation counting. Now, if we can just go through, we have learned how liquid scintillation counter works. Uh, it has it is a very versatile technique, very accurate and very efficient technique, particularly for 3 H isotopes, which are very weak. There is a particular way of energy transfer from radio isotope to solvent to primary floor to secondary floor and photo multiplier tube. And then you have lot of advantages in this particular technique in terms of uh, like efficient counting which is efficient efficiency is almost 50 percent more uh, in terms uh, in uh, for 3 H. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, measuring more than 2 isotopes at a time through different channels as we have seen dual labeled uh, samples could be measured easily. So, there are a whole lot of advantages and a lot of disadvantages has been uh, partly or completely solved also. So, it is a very versatile very useful technique. Uh, it is much widely used in comparison to say uh, GM counters or GM counting which are very handy but and routinely used, but uh, mostly for uh, routine purpose and not for uh, like accurate uh, quantification actually. So, we have discussed two methods of detection of radio activity. Now, let us move on to the third method of detection that is auto radiography. Now, auto radiography is a technique to uh, localize or to detect or to visualize radio activity uh, radioactively labeled samples using x-ray film or nuclear emulsion. Now, it utilizes the action of ionizing radiation on a photographic emulsion for locating a particular radioactive material in a specimen. Now, when we say auto uh, this prefix indicates that radioactive material is within the sample or object which is going to be imaged, imaged here in contrast to radiography. Now, recording medium which makes visible the resultant image is usually uh, nuclear or photographic emulsion. Now, after chemical development the resulting pattern of grains show the distribution of radioactivity substance in a specimen and microscopy technique uh, it could be light or electron microscopy could be used for observation. So, this is uh, another technique which is based on exposure to photographic or nuclear emulsion. Now, here uh, there are certain differences from a standard uh, photographic film uh, emulsion, which is that nuclear emulsion uh, differs from a standard one in a high ratio of silver halide to gelatin roughly equal volumes at least in nuclear emulsion or may be higher and also in the size of the grain. So, you will have a small size of the grains and the nuclear emulsions as compared to photographic emulsion. Now, although auto radiography is used to locate rather than to quantify, uh, but you can use densitometers which could be used for quantification as they will record the intensity of the image. So, that could be done. In biology this technique has a lot of uh, different applications. It may be used to determine uh, tissue localization of a radioactive substance uh, either introduced in to uh, uh, either introduced through a metabolic pathway or it is bound to a receptor or hybridized to a nucleic acid and a lot of other uh, ways it could be uh, localized or detected. Uh, one example could be like say if you want to determine the site of location of a particular drug which could be radioactively labeled then uh, where is the location throughout the body. Then what could be done, done is that the whole body section of animal could be kept in close contact with a sensitive emulsion which could be x-ray plate or other nuclear, nuclear emulsion. After an exposure for certain period of time the development of x-ray plate will exhibit an image of tissue or organs where radioactivity was present and thereby location of the drug could be find, found out. Likewise radioactive metabolites can be located and recovered on a chromatogram or electrophotogram in various metabolic studies. So, uh, that is how you could 
it could be a very useful technique. Uh, photographic film and auto radiography technique has come a long way from the time in it where in 1867 it was observed that uranium salts uh, were responsible for blackening of a photographic film to uh, now where a lot of progress has taken place where different kinds of uh, emulsions which is liquid photographic emulsions has been developed for auto radiography a stripping film technique has come up and finally uh, it is like imaging plate technology has come in uh, in 1990s. So, a lot of progress has taken place uh, in, in this field of auto radiography. Now, let us little bit deal about the principles of auto radiography. Now, radio active isotope have ability to blacken photographic emulsion and let us see how uh, the whole thing occurs actually. Now, for an auto radiograph or radiation source that is radioactivity is required which is emanating from within the material to be imaged that is object or sample. Then you require a sensitive emulsion, so which will be exposed here. Now, emulsion consists of a large number of silver halide crystals as we have discussed which are embedded in a solid phase gelatin. So, what happens beta particles which are emitted by a radionuclide or, radio, or a source radioactive source they will penetrate the film emulsion to a depth which will be proportional to its energy. We are going to discuss that in little detail. Now, as particle passes through the film they will activate the individual silver halide grains in the emulsion. Now, this is because of the interaction which could be electro, electron interaction with electrons or nuclei and once these individual silver halide grains uh, are activated they are rendered or we call them it renders them to susceptible uh, to conversion into a metallic silver that is they are exposed and they form a latent image. Now, they could be then developed by a photographic developer which uh, can show them as the blackening of film and fixers to remove any remaining silver halides that image could be formed or uh, auto radiographic image could be formed. Now, each emission converts silver ion to a silver atom to produce a latent image and when in the development stage these silver atoms uh, catalyze the reduction of the entire silver halide crystal to a metallic silver which produces an auto radiographic image of the radioisotope distribution. The distribution of radioactive material may be investigated as function of time after the injection of the radio labeled compound and like for example, in pulse labeling. Uh, in place of photographic film uh, like I said image plates have come with imaging plate scanners uh, which could be utilized which you can uh, uh, manipulate the film digitally also. Now, uh, this figure uh, let us little bit see uh, get into this figure here uh, which kind of explains uh, what we have discussed now. Now, if you can see here there are few things one is this is your sample and this sample contains the radioactive material this is your red colored is radioactive material. Now, this sample with radio isotope uh, is what it is done you have covered it with nuclear or photographic emulsion and as the radioactive uh, source emits the radiation or particles this that could be like say beta particle it will strike it will interact with these grains here which are shown uh, round grains here. Now, these grains once it interacts they are activated on exposure and they are sensitive it means they are sensitive for uh, to be developed and then when you develop the blackening of the film is seen in here. So, what you see is here that how the uh, from exposure to blackening or to development of the film where you can see the image occurs. Now, we call this one is called emitter which is this and emulsion this is and which is this. So, emitter to emulsion relationship is very crucial. Uh, let me show you in this uh, uh, let me show you on your screen actually uh, this whole thing that how the emitter and uh, emulsion uh, is important. So, there could be lot of different arrangements like one I have shown you 
now these arrangement arrangements could be many different kinds as you see on our screen if this is your glass slide then if your emitter could be this could be your emitter which is if I say this arrangement this emitter and emulsion arrangement that emitter is under. So, emitter is under the emulsion actually there could be another arrangement where you have you have this is your emulsion like this was your emulsion here. So, and emitter could be above or on surface of the emulsion. So, this will be called condition which is on the surface of the uh, emulsion. There could be a third condition where it could be like you have emulsion and your radio isotope is distributed here and we can say this is in actually this your emitter and emulsion relationship is that your emitter is in the emulsion and there could be third one where what you could have is you have emulsion here you have emulsion on the top and your emitter is in between that is uh, it is sandwiched between the emulsion. So, uh, you could have either of these conditions which is it could be uh, under it could be on the surface it could be in the emulsion and it could be sand sandwiched between uh, uh, like uh, in the emulsion. Now, if you see here uh, to go a little bit if it is in the emulsion which is uh, first place uh, under the emulsion then uh, half the radiation goes in one direction and half the radiation goes towards the emulsion. If it is on the surface again all these half which will go on here all the emulsions and half or less than 50 percent will reach the uh, the emitter, uh, emulsion actually. Uh, here also that will be like going they will go in all different directions here and this one here will go it will be exposing on all sides actually. So, you will see you can see that depending on the emulsion and emitter relationship they will be exposed to a certain extent uh, as not all the particles emitted will be uh, hitting the emulsion all right. So, this was a uh, little bit to show you the relationship between the emulsion and the emitter uh, and which is very important in terms of lot of factors which we, are, which we are going to discuss in a little while. Now, auto radiography can be done on either microscopic scale or macroscopic scale. So, when you say microscopic autoradiography, its a resolution is down to 0.5 micrometer or so and it is done for localization of a tracer at the tissue or cellular level. If it is a macroscopic autoradiography, then resolution could be uh, down to 50 micrometer and localization is at the organ label. So, uh, now, what are the most suitable isotopes which are used in biological systems for autoradiography? Most commonly used radioisotopes are of three types which could be high energy 32 p, it could be medium energy like 14 c and 35 s beta emitters and it could be low energy like 3 h beta emitters. Uh, very uh, not so frequently alpha emitters like polonium or thorium can also be used. So, we are going to discuss about uh, uh, like how they will be exposing a particular emulsion. Now, first thing when we are talking about the exposure of a photographic film there is when these uh, radio uh, uh, particles or emitted particles when they expose there are certain factors to be uh, uh, considered one is that is track length of various emitted particles. Now, when a particle emitted by a radioactive source passes through a nuclear emulsion, it loses energy by collisions with nuclei and other orbital electrons. Now, this energy produces defects in the silver halide crystals and renders, renders them developable as we have discussed earlier and they are exposed. 
So, the resulting patterns of the grain in the emulsion is called which you will see finally, is called track and it is characterized by uh, three parameters uh, which, is, which is length, which is grain density that is grains per unit length or grains per total track length and shape which could be linear, curved and angled. So, the parameters are determined by the mass and energy of the particles, emulsion and development of emulsion. Let me show you a uh, little bit uh, what does that means like track length and all those things. Say this is your emulsion actually which is uh, server halide in gelatin. Now, when we say uh, that uh, a radio uh, isotope uh, or beta particle emitted from a radio isotope exposes or interacts with the uh, silver halide crystals here and finally, you get a track. What is track means? Track means a pattern which is obtained uh, after the exposure which could be a simple line, it could be a straight line and most of the time the density of the track as we will discuss is more at the end of the track actually. Like if it starts from here, the density will be higher in this particular area. Then it could be like it could have different kinds of like it could be straight, it could be curved or it could be very small actually. Like for 3 H it will be uh, very uh, like it does not have so much of energy to have a longer tracks. So, you have a, a track has a particular direction, it has a particular density which is grains per unit length exposed and uh, it has a, a particular kind of like in uh, uh, how many grains it is going to expose. So, this is like what we were talking about uh, here, let us move back here. So, what we were talking about is that uh, three parameters that is length, grain density and the shape. So, length will be higher if the higher energy is there, the grain density per unit length will be uh, mostly again by energy, but it is uh, the track length will be or density will be higher at the end of the track and the shape which could be linear, it could be curved, it could be angled um, as per the particular kind of the emitter actually. So, uh, let us see each of these emitters and their effect on the uh, particular uh, or effect on nuclear emulsion actually. All right, let us discuss with alpha particles. Now, alpha particle as we have discussed earlier also, it is a heavy uh, doubly positively charged and less penetrating. So, these massive particles are not affected by collision with electrons and usually maintain a straight path. So, like I showed you earlier that they will maintain a straight path after collision and will have a tremendous disrupting effect on orbital electrons as they pass through emulsion. Now, this results into excitation of almost every silver halide crystals they interact with and therefore, generate a very high grain density or uh, and alpha particle will lose energy rapidly as it interacts with very large number of electrons per unit distance. So, therefore, it will have a short and a straight track length which is usually 15 to 40 micrometer. So, uh, and it like because it loses energy very fast though it has lot of energy, but because of its bigger size it loses energy very fast and it has uh, uh, straight and short and dense track length. As far as beta particles are concerned there are three kinds of beta particles which is high energy, medium energy and low energy. So, when these beta particles these are electrons only and these are scattered easily by orbital electrons. Now, as they collide with other electrons, they rapidly lose energy and sharply deflect it at each collision. So, the magnitude of this will depend on their energy. Now, at a very high energy like say for 32 p, particles have a tendency to move in a straight line with minimal deflection due to great momentum. Now, energy will be lost after each collision with an orbital electron and probability of deflection in subsequent interaction increases because you lose energy and uh, the straight path may not be maintained. For short distance the track remains fairly straight as these deflections are balanced out because of high electron density of matter that is silver halide. 
through which they are passing. So, the grain density increases as the particle loses energy that is at the end of the track like I said meaning that grain density will always be greater at the end of the track than at the beginning. So, that is a very important uh, factor here. Uh, so, so, like I said if you have three kinds of beta particles that is high energy, medium energy and low energy we will see how they affect uh, as we discuss. Now, weak beta emitters like 3 H, 14 C and 35 S are most suitable and uh, these ionizing tracks of these are short and give discrete images uh, as compared to 32 P. So, they have a short range of the particle uh, this permits accurate localization particularly 3 H is the best radioisotope like I said it has less energy it will form short tracks uh, as compared to 14 C 35 S and particularly 32 P which is which will form longer tracks and uh, to uh, really localize it will be difficult. Now, microscopy can be used for uh, to uh, locating the image in developed film. Now, for localization of DNA bands in an electrophoretic gel 3 H cannot be used there 32 P is used. Why? Because low energy 3 H negatrons will dissipate then their energy within the gel and in the wrapping around the gel thus reducing the sensitivity to a very low level. So, more energetic 32 p negatrons leave the gel and produce a strong image. So, depends on type of application here uh, uh, which we are talk talking about. Now, radio isotopes if you can see this table uh, there are a whole lot of radio isotopes could, could be used in here for this particular application which are 3 H 14 C 35 S 32 p and 125 I and which has mostly beta and 125i gives gamma radiation. All right, so uh, that now we have talked about types of uh, particles or radioisotope particles which are being used in here like mostly beta particles. N now, let us little bit discuss about types of emulsions actually. Uh, there are three types of commonly used emulsions. Uh, one is called pre-mounted emulsion another is called liquid emulsion and third one is stripping film. Now, pre mounted emulsion is a relatively thick may be 50 to 200 micrometer thick layer of emulsion mounted on a glaze glass microscopic slide. As far as liquid emulsion is concerned it is used in dipping method. So, what is done is it is supplied as a shredded gel which could be melted a sample mounted on a glass microscopy slide will be dipped into a molten gel and taken out and the emulsion hardens and forms a film of a particular thickness depending on the concentration of gelatin in liquid. The third one is stripping film it is supplied as a thin 5 micrometer film mounted on a glass and can be removed from the glass with a razor blade and then can be placed on the water surface. Now, the pre mounted sample is placed under the floating film and lifted and then this is allowed to dry and thin emulsion adheres tightly to the slide. Now, let us see each of them uh, in these figures here. So, if you can see here in dipping method which is uh, used for liquid emulsions uh, what is done is there is a liquid emulsion filled in this beaker and you have a slide which contains the specimen or the sample. You dip the slide into the uh, liquid emulsion which is melted and then take it off and then it is allowed to dry. The liquid emulsion will form a covering around the sample and on the uh, on other parts of the slide and then once it is ready this could be uh, used for uh, this could be exposing and it could be then finally, used uh, will be allowed to form the radiographic image actually. So, this is uh, how a dipping method is uh, performed um, then there is a stripping method. Now, stripping method like I said a sheet of commercially available available stripping, stripping film is utilized uh, which could be removed with a razor blade and uh, like uh, let us see like how this works out. So, what you have is you have a cross section of film here it looks something like this there is a rectangular or you can say square uh, strips here which are on a glass or plastic surface. Now, with a razor you can remove each of these strips here uh, one by one and could be used what is done is this will be put into the uh, water and 
it is allowed to swell. Uh, then as it spreads out, what you can be done is uh, a slide with sample could be taken and this could be put under the film and then it could be lifted like here it is seen, it is lifted here. The film wraps around the slide and the slide contains the sample uh, under this uh, particular stripping film. And so finally, what you are going to get is something this that it is a tra uh, it is a adhering film or uh, which is trapped around this particular glass slide and this finally, could be utilized for developing autoradiography image. Uh, so, that is how three kinds of emulsions are utilized. Now, very important part is uh, of this method of or any method is what is the resolution, efficiency and the background problems. So, high resolution, high efficiency and low background are important factors to be um, attained in any experiment. So, let us little bit discuss about uh, these factors in autoradiography. Now, resolution here first thing. So, as far as resol resolution in autoradiography is concerned, it is the ability to determine the position of emitting source uh, to separate the individual grains to get accurate grain count and to separate the emitting sources. So, that is what resolution is can you really uh, like uh, determine the position of emitting source and can you separate the individual grains to get accurate grain count that is the most important part. And if there are more emitting sources can you locate them or can you separate those emitting source. Now, this depends on various factors like we have discussed earlier and we will elaborate on that. Uh, it will depend on uh, types of radioisotopes that is energy of the radiation. Uh, if you consider energy of the radiation like I said 32 p, if you say we were talking about the track length now 32 p has higher energy. So, what will happen as it travels through the, uh, the emulsion in beginning there will not be any track which or if there is a track it will be uh, not distinguished from the background. So, what will happen that it travels to a certain distance and the track is seen only when it is uh, has traveled uh, or certain distance in the. So, it is very hard to localize it like from where unless it is traveling in all different directions and then uh, all of these tracks could be extrapolated to a origin. Uh, likewise, in say many times 14 c or 35 s gives curved surfaces. Uh, curved track actually. Now, these curved tracks again it is very hard to localize uh, if you have very need very high resolution uh, images. 3 h if it is a weak 3 h uh, weak beta particle from 3 h then uh, it might be very difficult to distinguish it from the background. So, all these factors uh, like uh, that is the type of radio isotope will determine the resolution as such. Then distance between the radio labeled compo component in the object and the radiation sensitive emulsion that is very important. Uh, for example, if there is a very thick uh, emitter then maybe a lot of self absorption occurs that might be a problem. So, that uh, that is thickness of the object or thickness of the emulsion uh, exposure period all these things will be affecting uh, the, uh, the resolution. Then size of the silver halide grain will certainly affect resolution. If it is the size is very large, it will be very difficult to uh, count number of grains because uh, uh, like uh, smaller grains will give higher resolution as compared to larger grains in here. Now, for example, if there is a 3 h then it may not be able to expose the larger grain or render it render it developable uh, rather than small grains which could be counted as well they could be distinguished from the unexposed grains here. Uh, sensitivity of the emulsion is also important like for example, if there is a uh, 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 emitter or low energy emitter then unless there is a sensitive emulsion it will be very difficult to uh, uh, see the image uh, from that particular uh, resultant of that particular emitter. Likewise, like if a certain emitter uh, uh, has a longer track length then it will only form uh, like uh, a track. Uh, when it can expose the grain and if the sensitivity of the grain is lower then you need more energy to expose that. 
So, uh, again uh, localization will be a problem and tracks will be appearing only at the end where a lot of energy is lost. So, these, these are very important factors in terms of uh, determining the resolution. Uh, then a second factor is efficiency. Now, efficiency means every decay should produce a track. Now, however, if the sample is on the surface of the emulsion, only one half of the decay will enter the emulsion. Now, even if we say sample is embedded in the emulsion, self absorption of energy by sample because of a finite thickness may not reach or reach with a very least energy and not suitable for producing a track. So, uh, that is another factor which has to be considered. For high energy isotopes like 32 p, self absorption is not a severe problem as a 5 micrometer thick sample thickness of cells or tissue sections absorbs less than 1 percent energy. But for low energy isotopes like say 14 c or 35 s almost like 82 and 70 percent uh, transmission uh, at the same 5 micrometer thickness. But for 3 h if you consider the, uh, the efficiency is very less it is like say 16 percent for 0.5 micrometer and 4 percent for 5 micrometer. So, these things has to be considered. Now, emulsion thickness also affects efficiency as most grains are produced near end of the track with 32 p having long tracks. Efficiency is proportional to emulsion thickness to a certain extent. Say for 14 c and 35 s maximum efficiency is reached at an emulsion thickness between 3 and 5 micrometer. For 3 h you have a range of 1 micrometer and nothing is gained by using thicker emulsion. So, if it is a 32 p you can use thicker emulsion, but if it is a 3 h you have to use very thin emulsion and there is no use using thicker emulsion for 3 h. So, these factors has to be taken into account uh, to increase the efficiency of the experiment. Then very important factor is background. So, developed emulsion that have not been exposed to a radioactive sample uh, contains dark grains and these are called background. Now, to identify a track like how to distinguish it from the background, a conventional approach is to look for at least 4 grains in a straight line to define a track. But in case of 3 H track may have only 1 or 2 grains. So, it is important to reduce the background to very low level if such isotopes needs to be used. Uh, there is another thing is background fog that is latent image on the developed film can result from say accidental exposure to light, uh, presence of chemicals or metals in the sample, natural background radioactivity like say from 40 k, uh, cosmic rays, mechanical pressure applied and the way uh, film is stored. So, a lot of these things can uh, give rise to background. Now, background can form before the sample is applied or during the exposure in liquid emulsion. Tracks are destroyed if when emulsion is melted. Uh, so, that could be one uh, thing. In a stripping film, the prior background is reduced to a greater extent as film contains a latent image fed, uh, fader. So, that could be another way to reduce the background. Background will always increase during exposure time. So, one has to uh, shorten the exposure time. Also, the problem of latent image fading uh, could be uh, another problem um, because uh, it refers to the fact that exposed grains gradually revert to the unexposed uh, uh, form, hence undevelopable. So, these all these factors has to be taken into account and they have to be considered when auto radiography is being done. Now, there are certain techniques to enhance the sensitivity factor or uh, sensitivity in auto radiography. Uh, these are uh, we will discuss them one by one. One is pre flashing. Now, pre flashing it is like as the response of photographic emulsion to radiation or light is not linear and involves a slow lag period or initial phase uh, before a linear phase is obtained. So, the sensitivity of the film may be enhanced by pre flashing that is it involves exposing the film to a millisecond flash of light prior to placing it on the contact with the sample. So, technique is often used in high resolution work. Then there is a fluorography. 
that means that radioactive sample containing soft beta emitters such as 3 H uh, in a chromatogram or electrophoresis gel, they can be located precisely as much of their energy is lost in the gel. So, they cannot be located precisely. However, sensitivity could be enhanced drastically by infiltrating the gel with a scintillator or floors like PPO and then drying the gel and placing it against a uh, pre flashed X ray film. So, the negatron emitted from the particular isotope will excite the floor and subsequently emit light. So, thus both excitation and ionization effects are used in fluorography. Uh, uh, it great uh, increases greatly the sensitivity uh, with low energy emitters. Uh, likewise, sensitivity can also be enhanced by adding floors to the emulsion. So, this is like uh, shown in this figure that there is a beta particle and there is a floor here which can uh, increase the sensitivity to many fold. And then the last one is intensifying screens. Now, this is an opposite problem to that of low energy isotopes. So, uh, here uh, radiation from high energy isotopes like 32 p and gamma isotopes labeled samples say for in proteins or other uh, samples. Now, these are highly penetrating particles or rays and as they penetrate through the film causing little exposure of the film and therefore, producing a very poor image. So, what happens? Substantial improvement in the image generation can be done uh, by placing on the other side of the film from a sample a thick intensifying screen made up of solid phosphor. So, negatrons uh, penetrating the film will cause the phosphor to fluoresce and emit light which superimposes its image on the film, film exactly and this can enhance the resolution many times. This is shown here, there is a cassette, hyper cassette, there is a uh, uh, like a particular kind of uh, uh, film and the sample could be placed in here. Uh, this is the active side of the blot and there is a phosphor surface. So, what happens when the high energy particles or rays cross over and do not expose properly uh, the x-ray film uh, from the sample, uh, then uh, image is superimposed which is made from fluorescence of this phosphor compound. So, this is one another method which could be utilized. All right, so, this completes our section on autogradiography and also we have discussed three methods uh, in previous lectures. Uh, which was based on ionization of gases, then second method based on excitation of solutions and uh, uh, solids and then finally, on based on exposure of photographic film that is autoradiography. Uh, now, in the next lecture, we are going to discuss one more method that is radio amino assay and also we will be considering uh, different safety aspects and applications of the radioisotope technique. Thank you.